During the 1982 war in the Falkland Islands between England and Argentina, the Royal Navy's 3,500-ton destroyer, the HMS Sheffield, was sunk by a single missile fired from an Argentinian fighter jet. In the days afterwards, some people began to wonder if uh, naval supremacy would ever come back, uh, if modern surface warships were obsolete because they were sitting ducks for today's sophisticated missiles. However, a later check revealed that Sheffield's defenses did indeed pick up the missile when it was fired. The ship's computer correctly identified the missile as a French-made exocet, but the computer was programmed to ignore French-made exosets, and so the missile struck the ship and blew it up. The Sheffield was, in essence, sunk by a missile that it saw coming and could have avoided, but didn't. Good evening, church. I am excited to be with you this evening as we continue this study through the book of Jonah. Uh, I know that it has been slow going, uh, but <clears throat> I think that that's been beneficial. The entire book of Jonah is only 48 verses long, uh, and so we could have very easily raced through it, but I think spreading it out has given us time to sit with the lessons we've been learning, particularly uh, lessons about the peculiarity of God's mercy. And tonight, as we work through Jonah chapter 3, we finally find Jonah carrying out the mission that God assigned him in Jonah chapter 1. Uh, he arrives in Nineveh with a warning, and the Ninevites, unlike the British Royal Navy, heed the warning and respond accordingly. Reading through our text this evening, I think it's important to highlight the message Jonah brings, which is simply this, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. It's important that we recognize that message and what sits behind the message, which is namely the one who sent the messenger, the Almighty God. And that matters because the message of warning that we find here in Jonah 3 is a message about both the holiness of God and the goodness of God. And that may sound a little strange, not that God is good and holy, but that that's what we can draw from this text. But that message of God's holiness and his goodness has the power to change the course of a life. And so if you would please stand if you're able in reference for God's word as I read these 10 verses from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. And Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days Nineveh will be demolished. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he issued a, de a decree in Nineveh. By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions, that they had turned away from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster that he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are uh, humbled to be here tonight. We praise you for your goodness, um, the common grace that we get to see on display in the world, the sunshine, uh, the warmth the green grass, the, the beautiful fragrances of flowers as they begin to bloom. Father, we praise you for your goodness that's display on the world, displayed in the world, excuse me, and we, and we praise you for your holiness which is displayed in your word. Father, we too often don't take seriously enough those two things, your goodness and your holiness. So, 
Father, thank you for providing ears for us to hear truth and hearts to be changed by truth and mouths to speak truth. And we ask that as this truth uh, is taken in, God, would you, um, would you bury that truth deep in our hearts? Would you give us um, power to carry out the things that you want us to do? Give us feet that run to those in need of the truth. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And please be seated. Well, here we are. Jonah goes to Nineveh. He's run the other way. He's tried to escape. He's done everything he can to avoid this moment, including telling some random people to throw him overboard and into the sea in the midst of a typhoon because he'd rather die than carry out the mission that God has assigned to him. And yet, here he is. He has spent days in the belly of a great fish. He has been vomited back up on dry land by said fish. And now we get the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. And this time, rather than running away, Jonah does what God has told him to do. Verse 3, Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, what we're about to cover in the rest of these seven verses is a little bit strange for any number of reasons, not the, not the least of which is Jonah's message as it is relayed in the text. This message gives no instruction, gives no rationale, gives no reasons, it gives no purpose, there are no causes listed that will lead to the effect that Jonah warns is coming for Nineveh. There's nothing about this message that says, this is what you are doing, and because this is what you're doing, Nineveh is going to be demolished. The message is simply, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Now, Mandy and I were actually discussing this last night. It's very interesting. It's like, really, is that, is that all of the message? Like, that seems, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe Jonah said other things. But whatever those other things may have been, they're not included. And so guess what? Whatever speculation you have about what that message might be is just that, speculation. And if it were important, God would have included it in his word. But he doesn't. And that has to be for a reason. Again, this is why it's weird. I'll be totally honest. I want there to be more to this message. I want... The message that Stephen delivers to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7, where he explains why everybody's sitting in judgment. I want that. I want a detailed exposition of what the sins of Nineveh are. But we don't get that. We get five Hebrew words. Od arbayam yom Nineveh hafak. That's it. Five words. No in-depth discourse about sin God and what God wants, nothing. One commentator notes, one commentator notes that Jonah's words were amoebic in form, but Jurassic in size. Every word weighed a pound. I want to focus on that very idea that every word of this message weighs a pound. The word Jonah shares with the people of Nineveh is a word of doom. To be certain, do not miss that. It is a word of doom, but it is a message that speaks to the character of God, both his holiness and his goodness. Holiness in that there is a judgment on those who disobey his command. And a message about his goodness in that he sends warnings and gives time for people to repent. And with that in mind, I want to remind you that the message of the gospel is a message of truth. That the message of the gospel is a message of repentance and that the message of the gospel is a message of hope. The message of the gospel is a message of truth, a message of repentance, and a message of hope. So let's first look at how the message of the gospel is a message of truth. Jonah goes to Nineveh, fulfilling what he didn't do in chapter 1, but he promises to fulfill it at the end of chapter 2. All right, but as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. <clears throat> And so he's belched out onto the land, and he goes, and he begins preaching his way through the city. And he declares, in 40 days, then it will be demolished. 
It's a short message. It's a blunt message. It's a harsh message. And to be totally honest, it's an off-putting message. But it's true. Just because it's hard and it's blunt and it's short doesn't make it untrue. It's not for no reason that God has sent Jonah to Nineveh to declare this message, right? Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. You may remember that I considered this all a little bit weird. Why did God choose this moment to intervene in the evil course of Nineveh? God could have just waited and allowed the Ninevites to run their course. Whatever. <clears throat> He could have dealt, he could have uh, chosen not to deal with them directly, but he does. And it's interesting because if you trust and believe that God is sovereign and all of his purposes are good and that his will is not going to be thwarted, then whatever and however and wherever and whenever God decides to work or chooses to work, his plan should be okay to us. In my eyes, it feels peculiar to me, and I think that there's a reason for it to be so, and we'll come back to it in just a bit. But God sends Jonah with a heavy dose of truth, a warning of the complete overturning of one of the largest, if not the largest city in antiquity. And as big as that warning is, it's based in truth. Why does Nineveh stand before the just and righteous judge? Because of their evil. Jonah knows how bad the situation is in Nineveh, as we'll see when we cover in chapter 4 in, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, he already knew, or at the very least suspected, what the results of his mission would be, and we find out that he's hopping mad about the fact that God relents in unleashing his righteous judgment upon Nineveh because Nineveh is full of evil. The punishment wrought of sin is inescapable by God, but by God's own hand. And so it's a peculiar mercy. While the Ninevites deserve the death that God has for them, just as you and I do, they don't know it until the message of judgment comes to them. But don't miss this. The message of the gospel, don't miss this. The message of the gospel is equal parts bad news and good news. Until you hear the bad news and believe and real, uh, really truly believe that it is the truth, then the good news doesn't carry much weight. At the doctor, I think they have special training for doctors in bedside manner because they don't start the sentence by saying, the good news is that it's treatable. They start off by saying, the bad news is it's cancer. And then they say, the good news is it's treatable. And it's got a 98% cure rate. So that offers some sense of comfort in that moment. That good news of it's, it's 98% effective, you might go, but that's, if they said that first, you would go, but there's 2% that I'm still going to have kids. It's equal parts bad news and good news. There's good news and there's bad news, and it's all true. It's all true. So here's the bad news. You deserve death. That's bad news. For anybody, that's bad news. But there's good news. The good news is, is that God is good. And he loves you enough to send Jesus to die for you. The bad news is, is that you cannot atone for your own sins except by your own death. But the good news is, is that God made perfect atonement for your sins through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He traded his perfection and righteousness for your utter, utter sinfulness. See, Jonah's message to the Ninevites is one intended for their good. And it's a message that warns by speaking truth. Nineveh sat in judgment. We must never forget the two-sided nature of the gospel message. Sometimes we get all touchy-feely about the good news. But nobody wants to hear the good news, and nobody will hear the good news, and grasp the good news and buy into the good news until they know that there's a bad news until they've experienced something awful and then they begin to say wait i don't have to experience this i can be restored i can my addiction can be broken 
I can be healed, this relationship that I have with my spouse that seems to be disintegrating before my eyes can be restored? So the gospel message is one of truth. Both the good news and the bad news. Uh, Secondly, the gospel message is one of repentance. Now that we're in Nineveh, I want to highlight something that I think is interesting. And God sends Jonah to Nineveh, the very nation he's going to use to judge his people in a little while, right? In Habakkuk, God responds to his query of God, like, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow your people to run amok? And God responds by saying, look at the nations and observe, be utterly astounded. For I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. From the outset, we've been looking at God's peculiar mercy in this series. And in the grand narrative of Scripture from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, we know that God redeems Gentiles through the blood of the cross. Right? He better because I'm a Gentile. Pretty sure everybody in here is a Gentile too. By birth. But Jonah lies in the Old Testament, where Gentiles aren't redeemed by the blood of Christ. Yet. Yet. It's a time of division between God's chosen people, Israel, and the rest of the world. So this messenger sent to a people who are not only foreign, but are enemies of God, seems correct by the overarching story of the Bible, but in that moment it feels very odd. If you were a Jew in those days, what unfolds in the book of Jonah would certainly be utterly astounding by God's own words in Habakkuk. And it would be utterly astounding because of how far away from truth the pagan culture of Nineveh was in its day. And why why is it utterly astounding? Because God is sending a message to a pagan and evil culture in an effort to get them to repent. If God wasn't interested in their repentance, why send a messenger at all? Why not just wipe them out? Or why not just allow them to continue on this path? And this is where I find, out, find something fascinating about the book of Jonah, right? The entire book of Jonah is really about repentance. It's about God's mercy being shown, right? First, he shows mercy to Jonah by giving him a second chance. He shows mercy to the sailors. He shows mercy to Jonah by rescuing him from the belly of the, or from drowning in the sea, um, but you know, he shows mercy to Nineveh by sending someone to warn them of their impending doom. Of course, this is the plan all along, right? I believe God does nothing in reaction to what's unfolding in the course of time. Rather, he is proactive in arranging for this moment in time. And so at this moment of time, we see that they repent. They turn it around. Verse 5, then the people of Nineveh, then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. God sends Jonah to Nineveh so that Nineveh would repent. Now I'm going to peel back the curtain on sermon prep for just a moment. One of the questions I ask myself when I'm working up a text to preach is this very question. Why is this text important for a fallen person to know and understand? And I wrestle with why God, in his providence and guidance by the Holy Spirit, put this text into the Bible in this time and in this way. I do. When you look at the scene and how it unfolds, you cannot get away. You cannot get away from the fact that God sends the message of judgment to spark a reaction in Nineveh. He desires the Ninevites to come to repentance. Looking at what we see here in Jonah 3, you can draw a line between Psalm 94 Verses, I think it's 8 and 9, where it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And 2 Peter, chapter, or, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where it says, The Lord does not delay his promises, some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The message of the gospel is about repentance. Here's the mind-blowing thing about all of this to me. This exact situation, what happens in Nineveh, is exactly the point Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 12 when the scribes and Pharisees begin to question Jesus and they're looking for a sign 
for him to demonstrate that he's the Messiah. Listen to what he says. He says, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Then he follows it up with this. He says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's preaching. Not at the miracle, not at the sign. They repented at Jonah's preaching. You gotta imagine, Jonah's been in the belly of fish for three days, probably not looking great. Probably looking a little, a little careworn, a little bedraggled. Probably doesn't look like he stepped into church wearing his Sunday best. They repented at Jonah's preaching. It's the difference between the Ninevites and the scribes and Pharisees in the context of Jesus' life and ministry could not be starker, but you have to look beneath the surface of the text to the rationale behind it. What if, what if God sends Jonah to Nineveh for this exact interaction that's going to come some 750 years later between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes? What if God's purpose in bringing this example of a message of judgment being received with open ears resulting in repentance, what if he's using that to bring judgment upon the scribes and Pharisees who refuse to even consider that Jesus is who he says he is? That's wild, isn't it? But we have a God who is amazing and whose plans and purposes are far beyond our own comprehension. And God's plans are just and righteous and merciful. See, the untold story of Jonah's five-word sermon is not always plain and clear. Uh, the untold message of Jonah's five-word sermon is not always seen as the plain and clear message of the entire Bible, which is repent from evil and seek God. The Ninevites were warned so that they could repent. God extended an opportunity to them just as he extends it to everyone else. The gospel demands a response because of its bad news, good news duality. You can stay in the bad news. You don't have to take the good news. You don't have to accept it. You get that choice. But there is bad news that's eternal for those who reject the good news. But there's eternal good news for those who choose to see the temporal bad news as a problem. The gospel is a matter of life and death. I'm not saying that we have to give people fire and brimstone, <laughs> but the gospel message should do something. Ray Ortland says it all the time. The one thing the gospel never does is nothing. But speaking to his son in the faith, son in the faith Timothy, it's also something that can be applied to all of us. Regardless of your position, Paul says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. And catch this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. We have to have this message of repentance. Because that's how God opens people's ears. If we're not speaking about the gospel, how can people hear? So what do you do with that? I'm sure just a couple of quick bits maybe help you process of how that impacts your life. First of all, the life of a Christian is a life of repentance. It is not a one day you repent from your sin. It is a every single day, every single moment. You will be, cho you will be given the choice and faced with the choice to engage in what you want to do or what God wants you to do. Now, I'm not saying this gives you free reign to shun work because you want to spend a day in prayer or reading your Bible. I'm not saying that this is a uh, permission to hit the eject button on those things, but it does mean that you must consciously fight yourself. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He bends his will to God so that he practices what he preaches. 
Rather than being a guy who says, do as I say, not as I do, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he's found doing exactly that throughout his life. So firstly, make sure that repentance is something that marks your life. Secondly, be sure that the message you're sharing about following Jesus is not just sprinkling a little Jesus around on your life. The good news does have bad news. Those whom you counsel about faith and following Jesus, you need to be sure that they press in that the first step and the second step and the third step and the step after that and after that is a constant turning away from self and turning toward God. You cannot continue doing what you used to do if you're going to start following God. It's constantly turning away from the human natural desire to satisfy and govern self in order to turn more fully into someone who is wholly submitted to God's design and plan. When you counsel people, you need to tell them that. The gospel message is one of truth and repentance. Lastly, the gospel message is one of hope. I look at the king's response to the people's response, and I'm reminded of a story I once read about the 1950 Grand Prix of Monaco. And uh, after his opening lap, uh, an Argentinian driver, uh, Juan Miguel Fangio, um, was approaching a dangerous bend after the first lap for the second time, and uh, he noticed that something was wrong. Nobody was looking at him. There wasn't a single person watching what was coming down the track. Everybody's head was turned this direction. Their attention was grabbed by something over there. If they're not looking at me, they must be looking at something more, more interesting around the corner is what he reasoned, what he told afterwards. So he hit the brakes hard, carefully rounded the corner, where he saw that his split-second assessment had been accurate. The road was blocked by a massive pileup. See, the king in Nineveh sees the response of the people and recognizes, oh, something's afoot. I need to pay attention. He assesses the situation and he heeds the message. The king catches word that something's going on and he himself responds when word reached the king of Nineveh, right? <clears throat> Here in verse 6. He got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh. By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. And then he says the kicker, each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Repentance, right? But there's a hope that goes with that repentance. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. It's that last portion that really draws my eye. This king of Nineveh notices what's happening. He says, let's make this official. This could be really bad. We obviously have done something significant for this Hebrew prophet to come and pronounce a message of judgment. Now perhaps, again, we don't get it in the text, perhaps the king of Nineveh is having a Rahab and Jericho moment. The Israelites begin approaching Jericho. The spies get in, they're looking around, and Rahab brings them in and says, People here are petrified about you people because they've heard what your God has been doing in leading you out of Egypt and everybody's falling away before you. Here in Nineveh, perhaps the king has heard about this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the miracles he's performed for his people. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe it's the gravity and the bluntness of the message. Maybe it's the condition of the messenger. But whatever it was, we don't get that part of the equation, but whatever it was, we do see and hear that the message of warning and impending doom comes and the people and their king respond by repenting. And by the way, they respond in a thoroughly Israelite way of re repenting. Not the way that they would normally do it. If one of their little g-gods was angry, they would have poured out wine or sacrificed food or done unspeakable things in a pagan temple. 
to appease said little g God. But the Ninevites take ownership of the evil that they have been allowing to grow or been promoting themselves. In the words of the king, he goes beyond just the sackcloth and ashes and fasting. He says, each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. And the hope is that in repenting from their evil ways that God will repent from his judgment. We get into discussion about whether or not this Ninevite repentance took or if it was a Hail Mary. To be perfectly honest, it seems like it was a Hail Mary because God does use the Ninevites later to judge his people. And they're pretty awful when that happens. But it's important to note that the heart of repentance here is an acknowledgement of sin and need of salvation of need of rescue, a need of intervention. And without a sacrificial system like that practiced by Israel, handed out in the law of Moses, this was all the Ninevites had, and so they did what they thought they could do. And they hoped that it was enough. And it's so simple because their simple act of repentance was enough. Their faith was put on display by how they responded to the message. God simply accepts their repentance and relents from sending the catastrophe. He doesn't give them holy homework. He doesn't lay out the law for them. He just takes them where they are and takes what they know to be true, that they are in judgment for their evil, and so they repent of it, and God did not do it. That's what the text says. So here's the clincher. Here's the cap on all of this. The gospel message is a message of hope. Look, the world around us is a world that is hopeless. Anxiety destroys teenagers. The world at large perverts the words love and acceptance. Political agendas consume the notions of justice and identity and the value of human life. Show me, show me where there is hope in society. Somebody, please. I promise you there, there isn't. Not a real hope. But those who follow Christ are a people of hope. Those who believe that both the bad and the good news of the gospel are true, and those who orient their lives around it, must then be an example of hope. Christian, you have a hope and a future, and it's not found in this world, right? It is found by recognizing that it isn't found in this world by realizing that you're not going to find it here and looking for it the one place where you can find it, which is in God and in Christ. Amen. Hope is found by throwing yourself at the feet of a merciful God. And this is the same merciful God who created the universe and everything in it. The same merciful God who clothed Adam and Eve to cover their shame and remind them that he still provides in the midst of disobedience. The same merciful God who sends messengers to people who deny and reject him in the hope that they would turn from their evil. The same merciful God who knew you were dead in your sins, and so he sent his own son that whoever believes in him would not perish eternally, but instead have life eternally with him. Folks, never forget, never forget that the hope of the world is the gospel. It is the message of truth that leads to repentance, and that repentance leads us to hope. May our message be one that is so truthful and so compelling that the people around us hear it, acknowledge their helpless estate, and repent in the hope that the God of the universe has made a way for their broken and fallen apart lives to be made whole again. May our message be that of A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the CMA Church. He's a Canadian. He says, The gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty may be revoked, that the condemnation of the sinner canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, the gates of hell closed, the portals of heaven opened wide, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed, the broken heart comforted, the sorrow and misery of the fall undone. That's the message of the gospel. 
May our message be like the message of Jonah, a message of truth about judgment that produces repentance, which leads to hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and your word. And though it is at times confusing, um, sometimes it's hard to figure out what in the world you're doing. God, as we dig in and we look, we recognize the truth of how good you are of the work that you're doing in the world and want to continue to do in the world in the coming days. Father, I pray that as we go from here, that we ourselves would remember that the gospel is a message of truth, that there's a bad news and a good news, and that the world has enough bad news, but we need to speak to how the good news changes the bad news. God, help us to remember that the message is that in order for the good news to be good news, people have to leave behind who they were to repent from their ways and to turn to you. Father, help us make sure that the message that we bring is not one of become a Christian and do X, Y, and Z, but that is there is life to be found in Jesus that there is hope for restoration and reconciliation to be found at the cross. God, I love you. I thank you for what you're showing us all through this, through this book and in this text. I pray that you would encourage our hearts as we leave here tonight, uh, empower our steps, embolden our mouths to speak your truth so that the world can come to repentance and experience the hope that's found only in, Christ, in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.